All right. Well, thank you all so much for logging in this morning and for taking the time to join us for this um, excellent program that we have, staying true to our core values during difficult times. I'm Bailey Gordon. I'm the Interim Executive Director for OK Ethics, and we are just thrilled that you're here with us. We have a couple of true HR professionals here. Um, they really are experts in their field, so we are thrilled to have Amber Bryant and Shelly Goodell with us, representing um, Bank of Oklahoma Financial and Loves travel stops and country stores. So thank you all in advance for sharing your expertise with us today. We appreciate it. So to get started, as you all know, we um, always have someone share our guiding principle, well, a thought about one of our guiding principles as an organization. So today we have Bill Riggs with us. He is a partner and former managing partner with the law firm Derner Saunders, Daniel and Anderson. He joined the firm after graduating from the University of Arkansas Law School in 1979. Bill is married to Sharon, the girl next door, which I feel like there's a story behind that, and has an adult daughter living in Texas. So Bill, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Bailey. I'm not gonna tell the story at this point, but uh, <laughs> let me go towards the guiding principle. It's close to summer and I'm thinking about ice cream. And listen to what Helen Szerski says about ice cream. When you zoom in to look at the physics and chemistry of ice cream, the first surprise is that it exists at all. On a microscopic scale, it's an unstable mosaic of solid, liquid, and gas full of shifting loyalties that only ever reach a temporary truce. There are clusters of tiny fat globules, each surrounded by a protective protein coating, the flat, fat globules then coat the bigger air bubbles. The rest of the space is taken up by solid ice crystals and the liquid sugar solution that fills the gaps and glues everything together. The sugar acts like antifreeze, stopping the liquid from freezing so that the whole thing doesn't end up as one solid block that no one could push a scoop into. Now, I don't understand half of what she is saying, but I love ice cream and perhaps even more, more so now that I know all the diverse elements of ice cream that have to work in unity to become the delicious treat I enjoy so much. We hear much about diversity today, but I want to speak this morning about the unity that makes diversity so fabulous. And surprise, you can find unity in almost every one of the OK Ethics Guiding Principles. How about that for a segue? You are the perfect audience to talk about unity. First, OK Ethics brings us together for a unifying discussion about ethics. Listen to these phrases from our guiding principles. We are an inclusive organization. We welcome members who are in different stages of learning about ethical behavior. We recruit other members. Our goal is mutually beneficial relationships. We attend meetings. We share thoughts, ideas, and resources. We are accountable for fulfilling our mission. We collaborate to achieve common goals. We seek cooperation and consensus. The second reason you are the perfect audience to talk about unity is this. When we talk about ethics, we are talking about a powerful force for unity. The study of ethics holds this group together, but ethics with its moral duties obligations, good and bad behavior has a greater impact. It is an important element to hold any organization, any group, any society together. Ethics is above each of us. It is not the province of anyone or owned by any person. And listen to these phrases pulled from our guiding principles. Ethics demands humility. It's something to be learned, actually continually learned. Ethical behavior takes practice to get it right. Ethics demands responsibility and accountability by each of us individually and by others. It's a two-way street. Ethics leads to respect. We recognize and respect others. We share our thoughts and knowledge with care and compassion. We are tolerant of and open to other points of view and outcomes. Objectivity and fairness to all persons is expected. We constructively engage in interactive discussions and we exhibit listening skills and actively listen to our discussions. Ethics leads to duty, duty of integrity, courage to speak the truth with confidence and encourage others to do the same. 
initiative to recognize what needs to be done, taking action to assist in that effort. Promotion of ethical behavior, service over promotion of self-interest, leadership, dependability. And ethics is all about working together, collaborative and gratefulness for what we can experience and accomplish when we work together. And ethics is about inspiring trust, which is today the key guiding principle. Trust that is built by integrity, objectivity, and fairness to all. Trust that is not to be taken for granted, manipulated, or abused. Let me close with one final thought. We need hunger for ethics just as we hunger for ice cream, or at least I hunger for ice cream. If we don't, listen to this word of caution from Ms. Sersersky. But this complex situation for ice cream can't last. Over time, water molecules will leave the smaller ice crystals to join the larger ones until only, only a few large crystals are left. The same thing will happen with the air bubbles. These are all components that like their own company and will separate out given the slightest chance. Ethics and the unity that comes with us ethics requires our focus and work and thus the OK Ethics Consortium. But if we do the work, we can add even more diversity now I'm thinking about adding strawberries, hot fudge, butterscotch, sprinkles. The possibilities are endless. That's all I've got. Thank you for this opportunity to be with you today. And soon, very soon, I hope to see you face to face. Thank you so much, Bill. I love those words about unity and um, hungering for ethics like we hunger for ice cream. And I definitely join you in that constant hunger for ice cream. So um, I love that um, that sentiment that we can hunger for ethics and um, inspire trust with fairness for all. So um, yeah, thank you so much for joining us today and for sharing those thoughts. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, that brings us to our keynote speakers today. Like I said, we have a panel of two really um, dynamic uh, women in HR who are going to be sharing um, who are going to be sharing with us today. So I will introduce you to each of them and then we will get started. So our first speaker today, Shelly Goodell, is the Senior Manager of Human Resources for Love's Travel Stops and Country Stores at the corporate headquarters in Oklahoma City. She has more than 20 years of proven success as a human resources professional. She has worked directing and performing a wide variety of HR related services and her vast experience includes employee relations, employment law compliance and employment based immigration oversight. She's also worked in staffing and workforce planning and succession planning. Shelley's also skilled in employee learning and development and policy development and administration. Shelley has worked for large companies throughout her career, including Williams Sonoma and Cox Communications. Prior to joining the team at Loves, she was the Vice President of HR for Insurica. Shelley holds a master's degree in human resources management, and she and her husband David reside in Oklahoma City and have three children. Their daughter Brooklyn is 25, and their two sons, Josh and Aiden, are both 18. Shelly's personal motto is fun is my number one job requirement. If we aren't having fun, we're doing it wrong. So I love that energy that you're bringing to us today. And Amber Bryant is the director of HR operations and is a senior HR business partner at BOK Financial. BOK Financial Corporation is a $47 billion regional financial services company. Amber works at the organization headquarters in Tulsa, Oklahoma. The BOK Corporation has $92 billion in assets under management and administration, and the BOKF National Association operates divisions across Arizona, Arkansas, Colorado, Kansas, Oklahoma, Missouri, New Mexico, and Texas. The purposes has limited purpose offices in Nebraska, Milwaukee, and Connecticut. Throughout her 20 plus year career, Amber has worked in oil and gas, manufacturing and healthcare organizations. A graduate of Oklahoma State University, go Pokes, had to say it. Amber has extensive experience in employee relations, compliance, talent acquisition and training. And thank you to each of you ladies for sharing your vast expertise with uh, your vast knowledge and experience with us today. So Shelly, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. All right, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, I'm going to try to share my screen with you today. 
And I've told Bailey, I'm not a Zoom expert. My team uses uh, WebEx and Teams. So we'll just see how this goes, people. I am going uh, to start from the beginning here pretty quickly once I this screen goes away. I don't know why it's not going away. Let's see here. OK, does that work? Can you see that? OK, all right. So thank you for allowing me to be here today. I'm really glad to be here. I am, as Bailey said, Shelly Goodell, and I'm the Senior Manager of Corporate HR for Love's Travel Stops and Country Stores. And you can see this is like a pre-pandemic, post-pandemic picture of me. You can see I've gone completely gray. So that's what the pandemic does to HR leaders. But the groups I support are employee relations, so the HR business partners and the generalists uh, work on my team, learning and development, development, career development, succession are all a part of my oversight. And lastly, I have oversight to our employment immigration program. So a little bit of an interesting mix, but it makes it super fun. Okay, so here's what I'd like to talk with you about today. Um, I'd like to chat with you about how Loves really responded to the pandemic and how core values, our core values and ethics played a part in that. And we'll start with the core values and why they are so important. I, I would advise not trying to build core values during the middle of a pandemic, but if you have strong core values pr prior to a crisis, it can really help your employees survive and thrive. And Frank Love, who is the son of Tom Love, the founder of our company and co-CEO of Love's at the beginning of the pandemic uh, said, guys, we were built for this. And that became a rallying cry for our employees. He believed that we could handle it, so we believed. That was really important. Embracing change and struggle, embracing the change and struggle we experienced was really helpful. We knew we were gonna learn something from this, and boy, did we. And lastly, ethics and core values are intertwined. We behave ethically because of who we are or our core values. So just a little bit about the company I work for. I've worked for Loves for eight years, but if you come in contact with anyone from Loves, that's not very long tenure. You'll hear about people who've worked here 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. It's just very common. People come here and they stay. But a little bit about our history, I'm not gonna go through each of these, but I wanted you to see all of it. Loves was founded in 1964 by Tom Love and his wife, Judy Love in Watonga, Oklahoma with just a few thousand dollars. Now Loves has over 550 locations in 41 states. Our main customer is the professional driver with 24 access to clean and safe spaces to purchase gasoline, diesel fuel, compressed natural gas, travel items, restaurant offerings, all you can think of. Over the years, we ventured into other businesses, forming the Loves family of companies to really provide full service highway hospitality. We offer heavy duty tire care, light mechanical services and roadside assistance. Loves Hospitality, you may not heard about, have heard about that, provides a growing network of hotel, of hotels and storage rental locations. And Loves Financial offers freight bill factoring and back office support to professional drivers. So we are, we are closing in on 30,000 employees from coast to coast, and we have corporate offices in Oklahoma City, in Houston, and in Memphis. And I tell you a little bit about the history, number one, because I'm really proud 
of our company, but I think it is also important to understand that Tom and his family really built this company from the ground up. He was and is a visionary and influenced and still influences everything we do in the company. And you'll see this bottom quote from, from Tom Love. Every, almost every corporate employee at least knows this quote, yesterday's trophies don't win tomorrow's games. And uh, we take that to mean we have to continuously strive for improvement and customer excellence in everything we do. And you will find that mentality in all of our corporate offices and our stores. So um, what are our core values and why are they so important? I know you know this, right? We, core values are talked about all the time. But just as a reminder, I believe the core values really supports the company's vision and helps shape its culture. And these core values have been around for so long. I don't know actually when they were instituted at Loves, but they've been here forever. In a more personal way, core values are the beliefs you have about your life. They bring a sense of purpose and well-being. From a company perspective, love's core values have become ingrained. So one of the things we really try to do is the very first week a, a new hire is brought in, we put them through new hire orientation, and this is a part of it. We start with their personal core values. So we, we start there and work them through an activity based on that. And then we talk about love's core values. It's also included in almost every training we do at Love's, every big event um, in our communications. So it's really embedded. And I think that is critical so that it doesn't become just some placard on the wall that nobody pays attention to. So our, our values are focus on the customer, integrity, work ethic, innovative thinking and perseverance. And I try to think about which one of these was most pr prevalent or um, came out more during the pandemic. And in reality, reality, over the past year, all of these were exhibited. All of them had to be exhibited. I go back to Frank Love's comment, guys, we were built for this. We believed we were built for this because of the foundation of our core values. We had many, many difficult situations pop up, and I'll talk to you about a couple of those. But we would ask ourselves, and we had these conversations in leadership meetings, who are we? Is that who we are? And if it wasn't, we didn't do it. So we went back to these core values during the crisis. They became the roadmap or the guideposts for everything we did. Okay, so the first time I remember hearing about this virus um, was sometime late January, early February. It's hard to believe that 95% of our employee population in the corporate office moved to working from home in March. And I'll tell you, this was a real shift for us. We were what we would call an in-seat culture. That means that while we had a few remote working positions, um, most of our corporate employees were coming into the office every single day. And it took a huge amount of collaboration between HR, IT, operations, communications, and our senior team to make this shift to move everyone to working from home. And then over the summer, we allowed folks to move back to the corporate office, but we kept our building capacities really, really low everything in our corporate office had to change from a safety perspective. And we instituted significant safety changes. 
And if everyone could knock on wood, please, to this day, we've seen little to no in-office spread, which is really huge. A portion of our HR team learned first and then became professional contact tracers. That had to happen. And that was a big deal. We started hearing from employees that they felt anxious, um, isolated, that it was a struggle having children at home and trying to work. So we ramped up our mental health and wellness approach. And we did a lot of fun things like virtual coffees, um, virtual fitness classes. We started a wellness page on our intranet that really almost solely focused on mental health resources. And we've learned that many of our leaders had not managed remote employees. It was their very first time managing remote employees. So many of us who had had that experience began offering training to help coach and guide leaders and create frameworks for them to do that successfully. We started another internet page on COVID-19 resources and our VP of HR sent near weekly emails to our employee population on the latest information and transparency and communication was huge. We also had our operations VP and president and others who did regular videos for our employees to tell them the latest information related to COVID and offer resources. In our stores, we increased bonuses. We gave increases and bonuses to ensure they felt appreciated for, for the customer facing work they did. We reconfigured stores, we put up plexiglass and created exhaustive safety protocols in our stores as well. In the beginning and throughout the summer, we realized that COVID testing was a real problem. And so one of the things we did was partner with a vendor to get at home tests sent to our employees so they could test and send in their results. Our approach to the vaccine has been to encourage, educate and incentivize. We have also already had two vaccination clinics on site and we have additional clinics coming in April. There was a new challenge nearly every day. I'm sure Amber can attest to this. It was waking up to a new reality every single day. We had multiple task force meetings a week just to try to get our arms around the ever-changing environment in the pandemic and to also gather concerns and brainstorm solutions. So I'd just like to pause there. I know we're quickly running out of time, but can you put in chat for me, what was one of your biggest challenges that you experienced it during the pandemic? And maybe that's as a leader or just as a person. What were one of the biggest challenges you faced? And then I'd like to hear those if we have a second, Bailey, to do that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm seeing lots come through the chat um, pretty quickly, but um, it looks like ongoing staffing issues and job loss, isolation, like you mentioned with your employees and managing remote workers, probably for the first time. Um, yeah, adjusting to working without people around you daily, which is tough for those of us who are extroverts for sure, but um, finding childcare at home while trying to work. Um, homeschooling, um, yeah, man, just really managing your family, your kids' online school and work simultaneously. Um, yeah. yeah, boy, all that sounds super familiar to me. One of the things that was uh, incredibly helpful, our HR business partners and our employee relations folks are embedded in business units. And so they formed this real Velcro partnership with business leaders to try to tackle all of those individual concerns because they were all individualized, right? One, one employee might have an issue with childcare, another employee might have a medical issue and they don't feel comfortable coming into the office, right? All of those individual concerns had to be dealt with. So I appreciate you sharing that with me. 
So there were some really incredible positive outcomes from the pandemic. I know it is impossible to imagine what those were, but we really renewed our commitment to wellness and mental health. We have always had an employee assistance program, but it became critical it, during the pandemic. And we also looked for multiple other resources to help our employees with mental health concerns. So we expanded our EAP resources. I'll tell you, from being an in-seat culture prior to the pandemic, we learned how to work remotely. And I will tell you that most of our leaders would say that their teams were far more productive working from home, or at least as productive working from home. We began to embrace the flexible working arrangements. And I, I, and I think that will continue. We're already having conversations around that. Employees res resoundingly said to us that they appreciated our support and response to the pandemic. And Love's had a record setting year in 2020 while other large businesses were really struggling. And we, we believe that is because of our approach to um, our employees and, uh, and mental health and wellness. So just a couple of ethical concerns. And again, I know we're running out of time. Um, we had to deal with many. I just picked a few. Our store employees did not have the luxury of working from home. And ultimately they had riskier jobs. They saw hundreds of customers every day. So our corporate employees really tried to brainstorm how we could make them feel valued and appreciated and give them a voice. So we did that by checking in, having those check-ins, doing surveys, asking for their feedback, and then doing the things like increases and bonuses to show them how much we appreciated them and also focusing on safety. We tried very hard to uh, manage and maintain transparency. Even when things were difficult, we did not hide that. We talked about that. There were times we had to shut down stores because of a positive um, COVID case. And some of our employees wanted us to tell them who was positive. But we were very firm about our, our decisions to keep medical privacy private and the fact that we were not gonna share someone's personal medical information, but we did great contact tracing. And again, in our corporate offices, we have not had little to no in-office spread. Our approach, um, we had customers who didn't wanna wear masks, right? Our approach when customers were not wearing masks or refused to wear masks was first reminding them about our mask policy Second was offering them a mask. And third, if they still refused, was allowing them to shop. So that's a little controversial. And I know businesses have taken different approaches. Um, we did not want, we absolutely did not want confrontations between our employees and customers or between customers and other customers. We offered training to our store employees on how to handle these situations and how to diffuse. We also needed to accommodate, accommodate many different employee issues like medical concerns and school schedules. We did this gladly and worked with employees on what was best for them and the company. Again, our attitude towards the vaccine was to encourage, educate, and incentivize, but we were also sensitive and still are about the differing beliefs about the vaccine. So lastly, our attitude was one size does not fit all. We tried very hard to work with leaders and with individuals on teams to find workable solutions that, was, that were best for them and the company with always the backdrop of equity and fairness. So I am going to stop there. Bailey, I may have just fallen in the love with the sound of my own voice. I'm so sorry if I'm run out of time, but if you have, if we have time for questions, I'm happy to answer them.
Yes, yeah, I think while Amber's sharing her screen, we do have a couple of quick questions here. Um, one person asked what percent of employees are still working from home and another asked if uh, Loves is considering a permanent work from home policy. Yeah, I, we're considering a, a lot of things. Um, and right now, I would say most of our corporate campuses were right at 40% capacity. So 60% um, of our employees are still working from home. We're encouraging employees to come back to the office. And we'd like to have more employees, a higher percentage of employees in office right around the summer. Um, so right now, we're asking leaders to work with individuals on their team on transition plans. We have to understand that just because things are looking better. The anxiety, fear, panic doesn't just magically go away. People have been working from home for a year and they like working with their cat on their lap. They like being able to run to the washing machine and throw in a load of laundry. And so giving employees a chance to co-create their experience by saying, hey, what if you came back one day a week? What if you came back two days a week? That's, that's how we're transitioning people to help them feel safe. Bailey, what was the second question? Um, I, I think you've kind of answered it. Yeah, you're kind of what your work from home policy would be moving forward and someone. Perfect. Asked, yeah, so I think you're great. All right, Amber, are you ready to go? I am. Am I sharing the screen? Uh, I saw it pop up a moment ago, but then it went away. Okay, let's try this again. Perfect. Are we there? We are there. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you um, again for allowing me to come in and visit. My name is Amber Bryant, um, and I am the Director of HR Operations and a Senior HR Business Partner with BOK Financial. Um, so my screen is not working. Sorry, give me two seconds here. Are you still on my big screen? Yes, okay, yes. perfect. Um, so before I tell you a little bit about how we stay true to our values as we were responding to the pandemic, I wanna share a little bit about who we are. Um, so BOK Financial was actually started in 1910 as a regional bank um, to support the energy industry um, and we have since grown to an eight-state footprint um, that has, again, as Bailey mentioned, about $92 billion in assets under management. We offer an array of financial services that include commercial and consumer banking, wealth management, investment services, mortgage services, insurance, and even trans funds. We have about 4,900 employees. Um, that work and reside in 13 different states. And prior to COVID, um, as um, Shelly shared, we did have an in seat culture, whether that was working at an operations center or whether that was working at a traditional banking location or even in an office in downtown Tulsa. And at our core, BOK Financial is a relational organization. We value interacting with those that we serve. And so with that, our purpose statement is achieving more together. And that really is a statement about the difference we're trying to make in the world. It helps drive our decision-making and it helps us answer questions like, should we do this? And will it help our employees, our clients, and our communities um, by partnering with us as an organization? In addition to our purpose, we have four values that we that we operate by. Um, actively advancing the communities that we serve. We want to be known for unwavering integrity. We thrive on engaging, empowering, and investing in our employees. And we want to help prepare our clients to make great financial decisions. And I will tell you that those values were never more present than when we were responding. COVID-19. 
So let me tell you a little bit about how our actions over the last year supported those values. The first is that in addition to our annual charitable giving, um, we also donated $1 million to organizations across our footprint um, to help those that were on the front lines responding to COVID. As Shelly shared, we were committed to transparency in communication um, and just transparency about how we were responding. And so we had daily briefings with our emergency operations center, as well as bi-weekly virtual town halls with our executive leadership so that employees could hear directly um, about how we as an organization were responding. We also put in place a communication cadence for every single COVID exposure um, and positive so that employees knew what was going on. Because that, just like Shelly um, mentioned at Love, that be okay, there was a level of anxiety um, about exposures. And our employee relations team very quickly became experts at contact tracing. And we've continued that today. We also communicate um, if we are in a building with multiple tenants and we learn that a tenant employee has tested positive. So our, our communication has been transparent and often. At the forefront of our mind though, was how COVID-19 was impacting our employees and their families. Um, if you'll remember, we quickly learned about sending people home to quarantine about school and daycare closures and about needing to care for family members because they were suddenly without services that they were accustomed. And so to date, BOK Financial has paid almost two and a half million dollars in additional benefits to our employees. These benefits include every employee receiving an additional 40 hours of paid time off to help ease the burden when schools did not go back into session last March. We also have ensured that our employees who were quarantined and unable to work from home received their full base pay and they did not have to utilize their sick personal and vacation time. We implemented a daycare and technology reimbursement program and we sourced a vendor to provide online on-demand tutoring service at no cost to our employees with school age dependents. In addition to all of this, VOK employees assisted our clients in securing $2.8 billion in paycheck protection funds. So when, I, when we talk about living our values, I believe that, that this certainly supports um, that we put our money where our mouth was over the last 12 months. So as I was thinking about this session, and I knew that Shelly was going to ask, you know, what were some challenges? I also reflected on what did we learn as an organization over the last 12 months? But before I offer that, I'd love for you all to offer in the chat what you, what your organization learned over the last 12 months. And then I think Bailey's going to share the comments with us. Yes, we'll wait just a moment. I think that your response sounds incredible. Um, while we're waiting for some of these answers to come in, um, I have a quick question. You know, you have talked about all of the additional benefits for your employees, like the tutor, the free tutoring service and child care reimbursement. How do you feel like um, by offering, you know, that was clearly an extra cost to the organization. How do you feel like that affected your, um, you know, employee retention or morale or productivity? You know, so I'll tell you, we were working um, six, seven days, days a week um, through the summer dealing with contact tracing and having to have conversations that weren't always fun. But when we started rolling out the benefits, specifically around the childcare, it really, our employees were so grateful. It was not necessarily an expectation that we offer that level of benefit, but it was certainly welcome. And it was, we received comments like, this is why I'm passionate about this organization. This is why I believe in who we are and what we do. Um, and 
And so being, you know, having the opportunity to hear from our senior leaders saying, there's not, there's no question, this is what we're going to do. You know, there was never a, a oh gosh, man, do we want to spend that money or do we not? It, that wasn't ever a discussion. It was, we're going to support our team members through this. Does that answer your question, Bailey? Absolutely. And I'm seeing so many things come in through the chat. Um, one of the top words that I'm seeing is flexibility, that people learned flexibility, that it's important to people, that it's important for navigating these times. Communication and transparency are huge answers that I'm seeing come through. Um, learning that they can work remotely, that they have the tools, you know, relying on technology a little more. Um, I loved one. Um, that said access to professional development is easier than ever now that you can do that from your home or office and on Zoom. But um, just, you know, people learn the resiliency of their employees and adapting to change. That's kind of Absolutely. the overall. Perfect. Well, thank you all so much for sharing. And that certainly aligns um, with what we learned as an organization. And so one of the first things that I will tell you is that, um, you know, we, we learned that we were agile. We learned that we could make decisions quickly. Um, we did not, COVID, as, as Shelly mentioned, COVID did not allow us time to sit and ponder things and create flow charts and have multiple meetings. I mean, you were having to respond to a daily evolution um, that was happening in our living environment and in our working environment. The other thing that, that we've learned, um, and what I, what I call this really, is that we've learned to share. And we could not have managed the influx of mortgage business and the Paycheck Protection Program without employees being willing to raise their hand and, and transition for a short time into roles that were outside of their traditional scope. Um, this program, this redeployment and reskilling program was developed very quickly. And it's actually one of the one of the many pieces that I think we'll maintain as we transition out of the pandemic. <clears throat> the other thing, and, and I think um, Mr. Riggs mentioned this, and we, we learned a little bit of grace right through the pandemic. Um, we were all juggling multiple hats, whether you were sitting in a store location or a banking center or whether you were working at home, we were all juggling new sudden priorities. Um, and I think we learned to be patient when a dog barked on a WebEx and when kids were, you know, popping in to say hi while we were on our meeting. And I'll share with you that my 14 year old son learned that people really could see him dancing in his brief outside of my office doors. So that, that was a lesson for both of us. Um, virtual training. So we were fortunate um, to implement LinkedIn Learning in February of 2020. It's one of those um, better to be lucky than good moments, I think. And that really allowed our employees to continue their learning and development at home. And so we also made a huge pivot, as everyone did, from traditional, what I would call in-class um, offerings to a completely virtual course offering. And what that allowed us to do was to train double the number of employees in our BOKS boot camps than we had been prior. And again, that's another thing that we're going to take with us as we transition out of the pandemic. And I will tell you from a talent perspective, we also would be, I think, considered an in-seat culture. While we do have employees um, who, you know, live in states outside of our footprint, I would say that they were traditionally the um, exception. But what we have found is that we can source talent, we can onboard them, and they can be really effective and successful. And so what that's going to allow is us to expand our recruiting reach beyond what we would have considered. I think it will improve um, the diversity of our candidate population because we now know 
and have processes in place to support remote workers and ingrain them in our culture. And so with that said, I know Shelly covered a lot of the, the same pieces um, that we experienced. And so I didn't, didn't want us to be too duplicative in, in our message, but I know Shelly and I are both happy to answer any questions that the, the group may have. So Bailey, I'll turn it over to you. All right, great. Um, we have had a couple of questions come in and Amber, if you'll stop your screen share, we can be able to see both of you on the screen at the same time. Perfect. Um, so this is to both of you, but um, Lynn Flynn asked, how do both organizations get feedback from employees and customers to ensure the core values are consistent across their multiple locations? Shelly, go ahead. Um, yeah, so we, from an employee standpoint, we just did um, a culture survey. We just got the results back from that. And so we're going, we're going over that. We've been doing that yearly and we get great feedback from folks about, you know, lots of things, but one is, do they feel like they have a voice? Are they heard? You know, how connected do they feel to their leadership team? All of those things. From a customer perspective, we're continually gathering feedback in a multitude of ways. Our marketing department is very, very good about getting feedback. Also, just know that our that our store locations, the general managers get real time feedback from customers. And so um, one of the things we're known for is clean spaces, friendly faces. And we we own that. We talk about that in every training and everything we do. And we feel like we live up to that. So one silly thing that we've done, if you've been into a Love's Travel Stops, we've done in the past is we've put up in the restrooms um, this uh, basically uh, tool for customers to say yes the bathroom was clean there's a big smiley face or no the bathroom wasn't clean the restroom wasn't clean so um, we're we're always looking for innovative ways to gather feedback from both our employees and our customers and so, you know, similar um, to Love's, we're getting client feedback all the time, but we did survey our employees in May to say, do you have what you need? Do you feel connected? You know, I know that, that we're not sitting together, but are you still talking to your manager? Are you still engaged in the work? Because we wanted to know very early on where we were doing well and where we had opportunity. And so, um, and then as I as I shared, like on the daycare reimbursement, there were some of those anecdotal comments that really helped support that we were moving in the right direction. Great, perfect. Well, um, this question I think came up, Amber, while you were talking about your company culture and spreading that virtually. So do you have tips for successful onboarding and promoting your company culture virtually with new employees? So we, yes, actually we implemented um, this year, again, better to be lucky than good, um, a RISE mentor program. And so what that has done is it has paired an individual from a line of business with a new hire. And we then have um, our kind of, we call them culture ambassadors, um, reach out to the new employee, welcome them, share information about, you know, here's who we are, and then I'm going to reach out to you again next month, and we're going to talk about a little bit more and a little bit more so that we may not be able to be together, but you can start building the relationship in very short order. And I think it also, you know, I know it sounds maybe silly, but being able to see someone um, has been really helpful. And so we really promote the use of video so that we can have kind of that face-to-face -face interaction that helps with the relationship and, and culture integration. Great. Shelly, do you have thoughts on that as well? Yeah, can you repeat the question for me, yeah. Bailey? Um, what are your tips for um, successfully onboarding and promoting your company culture with new employees when you're in a virtual environment? 
Yeah, so we, uh, we, first of all, we have a fantastic recruiting team and our hiring managers work with recruiters on the store side. Um, but one of the things we try to do is, is really create this warm experience. One of the problems that companies all over the country, not just labs, experience is what we call ghosting. Um, and so we we encourage video, but we also encourage our recruiters to continuously reach out during the during the process. Right. That helps us prevent, quote unquote, ghosting, because when an employee applies at labs, they're also applying elsewhere. And we're we don't want to be uh, a little narcissistic to think um, that they're only just applying at loves. So we try to keep that relationship really, really warm until an offer is made or until we we tell them that we're not choosing them as a candidate. But again, what what we know is we want them to be a customer, right? Even if they don't choose to work for us, or even if we don't choose to offer them that particular position, we we want them to look for loves on the highway and to make decisions to choose loves. So we're always looking for the customer experience or thinking about how we influence the customer experience in the recruiting in the recruiting environment. The other thing I will say is just because you're not right for one position doesn't mean you couldn't do a host of other positions. So we try to look at candidates holistically, right? If they won't work for this position, what might be a good fit for them? Great. We've got a couple of kind of tactical questions for you. So first, um, uh, we have a question about what is the online resource that BOK uses for tutoring employees' children? Um, it's called the Homework Connection, and it is um, a fantastic service so that all you do is your employees go out, they create an account for themselves, um, we obviously provide a, a file to the homework connection, but then they have vetted um, every one of the tutors. They have to take a test to certify that they are knowledgeable in that area. Um, and then you can set a session for 7.30 tonight, right? So that you're home. Um, again, my poor 14-year-old son, I'm glad he's not on here because he would probably be sad to know I'm picking on him. But geometry um, is not either of our strong suits. And so we have utilized the homework connection to support those um, efforts at home. And so it's, it's been a great tool. Good. And one for you, Shelly, as well. What are the tools that um, you've used for mental illness struggles during COVID? What are some of those resources that you all provided? Yeah, so um, we use guidance resources. I, I don't know. That's through ComSight. ComSight is a great organization, um, but we've had speakers come in and do virtual classes on, on wellness, mental health issues. On the guidance resources website, there are there's a whole page devoted to COVID, but beyond that, if you're having a conflict with your boss, you can go out and read um, articles based on that. So our employees through our EAP program are able to get six sessions with a therapist per year per incident. And so that means if I am struggling with anxiety around COVID, I can go and have six sessions about that. Then if I'm struggling with my teenage son regarding geometry or homework issues, I can talk to a therapist for an additional six sessions. And then if I'm having marital problems because I'm spending too much time in, locked in the house with my husband, that wasn't true in my case, I really like him, uh, I, can I can go back to that therapist for another six sessions. So they're uh, through ComPsych, they also do a concierge program. So if people are struggling to find a daycare or if people are struggling to find a plumber, all of those, those types of things, they can use that resource for that as well. But we pulled in a lot of different information to our wellness um, intranet page to offer our employees. Awesome. And uh, there was a question, I think, for both of you in these increased um, and in these expanded offerings. Have you seen that employees are utilizing these new services? 
I'll just say for, for us, yes. Um, employees um, in the past, um, we didn't see as much utilization as we'd hoped. Um, we were, our HR department, our leaders were marketing our services or those resources all the time. And during the pandemic, it we really saw employees utilizing the resources. It went up considerably. Interesting. Yes, and, and BOK Financial uses um, ComSight as well for our employee assistance program. And, and we noted the same. Um, and, you know, Blue Cross and Blue Shield um, waived co-pays for mental health resources um, actually through the end of this past February. Um, and then we made sure that employees knew that we have a doctor on demand, which is a telemedicine um, option that was available. So we were really trying to ensure that our employees knew the multiple levels um, of engagement that they had around mental health resources, even if they did not necessarily have our medical plan. That's where ComSight and Doctor on Demand were really helpful. So we tried to take a holistic approach um, and consider those obviously that, that did not carry our medical coverage as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same. We we have some of those same services, telemedicine, and United Healthcare offers mental uh, mental health health parity benefit as well. And you're you know you're able to talk to a doctor twenty four hours a day through our telemedicine. Um, we had a question here from someone who asked if you have experienced any ethical concerns that you are able to discuss um, that were brought on due to COVID. So I'll, I'll jump in, and I know that Shelly referenced this. I mean, obviously, when you are in a client-facing um, business, you obviously have a concern. We want to ensure the safety of our, our employees, both from a health and wellness perspective, but also just from a physical safety perspective. And so we went back and forth on exactly how are we going to address that and how are we going to support them um, well. and you know, people are people. And so when you make an announcement that, hey, someone at this location has tested positive, they can't help but want to know. And so, you know, I would say those are probably the two major ethical issues that we dealt with was ensuring the safety of our employees, um, but also ensuring their privacy. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, same. same. We experienced a lot of the same issues. The only other thing I would say is um, it's not really ethical, but it's super challenging is um, balancing the needs of the business with the individual needs of the employee. And so we had employees or we had leaders who really wanted their employees to be on site because of equipment use or because of their own highly collaborative projects. And we um, we had team members who had medical issues or they lived with people who had medical issues. And, and so balancing, helping those leaders understand and talking them through, hey, do they really need to be in office to produce the same results? Sometimes those were difficult conversations, but I'll tell you, our leaders really stepped up and learned because many of them had zero experience doing it before, learned how to manage remote workers almost overnight. And so all of those trainings, all of those discussions, all of those roundtables about how to do this well um, became the focus um, pretty quickly after we transitioned everybody to work from home. Well, great. Well, it is 1230. And so we have reached our time limit for today. But this has been so fascinating. Thank you to both of you, Amber and Shelley, for your time and for sharing your expertise and also all that you've learned over um, over the course of this past year. I think it's definitely been one that we have, you know, we've never experienced before. So thank you all for sharing that and helping us all to learn how to navigate. Um, I loved how you said your core values became the roadmap 
for navigating the pandemic. And it's clear for both companies that they were. So um, thank you for sharing those with us. And as people are logging off, I do want to point out we have two national speakers coming up for April and May, which is very exciting. We have Robert Kerbeam, who is the Senior Vice President for Space Capture at Maxar Technologies. He is also a record holder for most spacewalks during a single space flight, um, and a former NASA astronaut and um, captain in the US Navy. So we um, we are really looking forward to hearing from him as he shares his expertise that he's learned through his service in the Navy, through his time at NASA, and also um, what he's learned in the business world. So we're looking forward to having him in April. And then we also have um, Rick Kite, who is um, oh, I'm sorry, who is the author and endowed professor and director for the D.B. Reinhardt Institute for Ethics and Leadership at Viterbo University in um, La Crosse, Wisconsin. So he's going to be talking about ethical decision making under pressure, which I think we will all learn a lot more about. You know, this is kind of a great segue, you know, using our core values and then, you know, how do how do we make those decisions under pressure? So I think we're going to have some really exciting programs and um the next couple of months. So we hope that you all will uh, join us for those. But thank you all so much for, uh, I see a few people have still hung around. So thank you all for um, being here. If you would like a CPE, make sure you're saying goodbye. So we know you are still here at the end of the program. Um, and we will see you all next month. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you.